Let's pray as we stand. Loving Heavenly Father, thank you that you are a glorious God, a gracious God, a generous God. Thank you for all of the good gifts that you have given to us. Thank you for giving us that most precious gift, your Son, the Lord Jesus, for giving us yourself. And Father, thank you that you invite us to be a part of all that you are doing in this world, that you would use people like me. Father, thank you that one of the ways in which you invite us to be a part of all that you're doing is by giving, giving sacrificially to the work that you are doing in Nottingham. So thank you for these gifts that have been given today. Please use them to build your kingdom so that more people might come to know you as the glorious and gracious and generous God that you are. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please take your seats. I hate walking. It's one of the reasons I became a fisherman much less cardio, much more upper body strength. No wonder Jesus changed my name from Simon to Peter, the rock. Uh, But there's this one walk that stands out. Jesus took me, James, John, his inner circle on a short walking holiday. The week before, that had been a bit weird. Uh, we'd, We'd worked out that Jesus was the Messiah, the King, big reveal, Then he started to talk about how he was a king who had come to die. Well, I didn't think that was very kingly. One thing led to another. He called me Satan, and now we were on this walk up a mountain. When we reached the top, my my calves, my, my lungs, they were burning from the incline, but the view, the view was incredible. But that wasn't what made this particular walk so memorable. What what I remember about the walk wasn't the view as we looked away from the mountain. It it was the view as we looked at Jesus. You see, something happened to him on that mountain. I'm still not entirely sure what. We were just taking our lunch out of our satchels, and then there was this blinding flash of white. I thought it was my body having some sort of allergic reaction to all the walking that we'd done, but but then I realized that the dazzling white was coming from Jesus. He changed in front of our eyes. I I want to say transformed, but but that doesn't quite do it justice. So me and the boys created this new word to describe on the way down, transfigured. One minute, Jesus' forehead, it was glistening. He had these unflattering sweat patches from walking up the mountain. The next, his clothes were radiant, white, whiter than snow. His appearance and his clothes, they they weren't the only thing that had changed. We, We thought that Jesus had invited his inner circle on an exclusive lad's walking holiday. We left the other disciples back in the town at the bottom of the mountain. But, but then suddenly Jesus had not one, but two plus ones. But these were some plus ones. Uh, none other than Elijah and Moses. The Elijah and Moses. And if I'm honest, I, I wasn't quite sure what to say or to do. James and John still give me stick for this. In, in my weird mix of excitement and fear, I said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here, because it was. It was an experience like none other that I've had. But then I went on to say, let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. That's the part that James and John ribbed me for. But here was my thinking. Part of me wanted to put up some tents as a, as a sign of respect for Jesus and his plus ones. I mean, it's not every day you get to meet the Elijah and Moses. I was starstruck. I didn't want them to leave. I wanted to bask in that glorious moment forever. But there was also something about Jesus that, that made me want to put him in a tent Uh, Don't get me wrong, looking at him was glorious. Uh, He looked, well, 
He looked beautiful, radiant, pure, clean. He looked glorious. As I looked at him, my, my eyes were transfixed as he was transfigured. But the longer I stared at him, well, the more fearful and uncomfortable I became. His beauty was glorious, don't get me wrong, but staring at him, staring at him in all of that glory, well, it, well, it just made me really aware of how dirty I was. His beauty made me want to avert my gaze because I knew how ugly my heart was. And so I think part of what made me offer to build him a shelter was that I wanted to hide him away. It was too much. I wanted to put him in a tent like one of those tabernacles of old. But in the end, none of those grand tent designs came to pass because on that clear summer's day, one cloud appeared and hid them all away. And then from that cloud came that voice. Oh, that voice. It's the kind of voice that made me want to bow to my knees and jump for joy at at the same time that, that gave me goosebumps and butterflies. And it said, this is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Listen to him. That was strange. Jesus had just been transfigured before our eyes. He looked more glorious than anyone or anything I've ever seen. And yet the voice didn't say, look at him. It said, this is my son whom I love. Listen to him. It's like that voice knew the conversation I'd have with Jesus just six days before. Uh, That one where I'd rebuked him for saying that he was a king who'd come to suffer and die. It was like the voice was saying, I only knew half the story. Sure, I might have known who Jesus was, the Messiah, the king. But he was saying that I needed to keep listening so that I knew what kind of king he was. I still hate walking, but that is a walk that I'll remember to my dying day. We're back in the book of Mark uh, over the summer here at Cornerstone in our evening service. And and if you've been with us over the past year, you'll know that we we worked our way through Mark's gospel in a, a few parts in a series titled, Who is This Man? It was a question that we saw answered in Mark chapter 8 as Jesus' disciples rightly identified him as the Messiah, the Christ, the King. But though in chapter 8 Jesus' disciples can look at Jesus and see his identity clearly, they've still got a lot of listening to do. Because though they have rightly identified Jesus as the Messiah, the King, They haven't yet understood what kind of king he is or why he has come. That's the question that dominates the second half of Mark's gospel. What kind of king is Jesus? It's why the Father's voice in our passage says, this is my son whom I love, listen to him. And so as we come to our passage this evening, let's heed our Heavenly Father's words in verse 7. Let's listen to the words of his son Jesus as he speaks to us by his spirit through his word, the Bible. And as we listen to Jesus' words, my, my prayer is that we will see more clearly what kind of king it is that we follow if we follow him. And that will lead us to grow in love for him in worship of him and in dependence upon him. So three points this evening are first. A king of glory. Glory's a little bit of an abstract word, isn't it? It can be a hard word to define and pin down, but we know glory when we see it. Glory has often been associated with power, and victory. 
Historically, people might have pointed to the battlefield, maybe to the gladiators arena, and and spoken of them as, as places where glory was there for the taking. And today, we might do the same with the sports pitch. The, the winning team covers themselves in glory. Sometimes, sometimes they win on penalties. But we also associate glory with beauty. Beautiful summer sunsets, slowly sending a spectrum of, of glorious color bursting across the sky. Or the dark night sky on a cold November's evening, suddenly lit up by the explosion of a glorious fireworks display. We know glory when we see it. And as Jesus leads Peter, James, and John on a trip up a high mountain, they get to see a glimpse of Jesus' glory. Verse 2 again, look with me. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses who were talking with Jesus. Jesus is transfigured before his disciples' eyes. One minute, they're they're on a walk up a high mountain. The next, glory. So they see Jesus' power and beauty on display. It's interesting that Moses and Elijah appear at this moment. They're often seen as representing the law and the prophets. But I think it's even more than that. In Exodus 33 and 1 Kings 19, Uh, You can read that both Moses and then Elijah, they saw the glory of the Lord as they too were up on a high mountain. Maybe take a read of those passages later. You'll, You'll maybe notice some more links that Mark wants us to see than we have time for now. But just as Moses and Elijah got to see the glory of their God in the Old Testament, so too do the disciples get to witness the glory of God in Christ here. And we saw earlier, didn't we, that that Peter, well, he responds in fear and awe. He's so captivated by the glory of Christ that that he seems to want to capture the moment. I think that's the best interpretation of what he says about three shelters. He, he wants to capture the moment. He doesn't want the glory to end. He doesn't want Elijah and Moses to leave. This is it, isn't it? It's what God's people have been waiting for, what the law and the prophets have been pointing to, God's glorious king and his kingdom. Peter wants glory now, and he wants it to endure forever. Which is why what the voice from heaven says is just so important. In Mark chapter 1 verse 11, at Jesus' baptism, we heard this same voice from heaven say, You are my son, whom I love, with you I am well pleased. Now we hear that same voice say, This is my son, whom I love, listen to him. In Mark 9 The Father's voice from heaven gives a reaffirmation of who Jesus is. But we also receive a new instruction. Listen to him. Jesus is glorious. His disciples have just seen him in all of his kingly glory for a moment. He is absolutely a king of glory. The instruction is listen, not look. And it's listen because there's more that the disciples need to hear. Because despite the fact that Jesus has already told them multiple times, what they're yet to understand is that point two, Jesus is also a king of suffering. I just don't think we can imagine how excited Peter, James, and John would have been coming down the mountain. How excited they would have been to share what they'd just seen with with the other disciples, with the world. You know when you receive that kind of news that you you just have to share? 
It just comes out of you. The kind of news that, that brings a smile to your face as you just think about the idea of sharing it with others. Well, these three have just seen the very glory of God revealed before their eyes. That is surely news to shout about. And then we read in verse 9. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. They kept the matter to themselves, discussing what rising from the dead meant. It's strange, isn't it? Jesus doesn't want Peter, James, and John to share what they've just seen. Why? Well, it's because they don't yet understand why he has come. If they were to share what they had understood so far about the Messiah, before he had suffered and died and risen from the dead, then they would have been sharing a faulty picture of their Messiah. A picture that would have led people astray and given them wrong expectations about what kind of king Jesus is and what it looks like to follow him. Tim Chester writes this, Peter, James, and John see a great vision of the glory of Jesus. Peter wants to stay gazing at it forever. But God will ultimately be revealed on the cross. It's in the weakness of the cross that we see the power of God. It's in the folly of the cross that we see the wisdom of God. It's in the shame of the cross that we see the glory of God. Jesus is the Messiah and the Messiah, he is glorious. But he is glorious because he suffers and he dies to save his people. Jesus is a king of glory, but he is also a king of suffering. But Jesus' disciples, they, they still don't understand. And so they ask Jesus in verse 11, why do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? Jesus replied, to be sure, Elijah does come first and restores all things. Why then is it written that the Son of Man must suffer much and be rejected? But I tell you, Elijah has come. And they have done to him everything they wished, just as it is written about him. It seems as though Peter, James, and John have, have heard some teachers of the law quote an Old Testament prophecy from the book of Malachi, chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, which said that before the Messiah came, before the day of the Lord arrived, God would send Elijah to prepare the way by turning hearts back towards him. But now Jesus, the Messiah, was here. Peter, James, and John had just seen him, revealed in all of his glory. So, so when had Elijah appeared? Had those teachers of the law misinterpreted that prophecy from Malachi, or, or had Elijah just come but gone under the radar? Had they missed it? Well, Jesus answers their question by saying that the teachers of the law, they were right to say that Elijah comes first. But that Elijah had already come, but definitely not under the radar. Elijah, well, he was John the Baptist, the one who had come to prepare the way for the king. And Jesus uses his disciples' question to, to further drive home his point that the Messiah must suffer, must die. What did the people do to the forerunner of the Messiah, to John, the one who prepared the way? They did everything they wished, rejected him, had him killed. And just as they rejected and killed John the Baptist, so too Jesus shows in verse 9 and 10 and in verse 12 that they will treat the promised king who comes after Elijah in the same way. That instead of welcoming him with a royal crown, he would be welcomed with a crown of thorns. That instead of being exalted on a throne, he would be lifted up on a Roman cross. 
Jesus is a king of glory, absolutely. And he is also a king of suffering. And that's what makes him glorious. But why? Why not just come in glory? Why suffer? Why suffer at all? That, that seems to have been the root of all this confusion for his disciples over the last chapter. That seems to be their objection to what Jesus is saying. Why not skip the suffering? Speed on to glory. Surely that would be easier. Tim Chester again helpfully writes, first the Messiah must suffer and die. The problem with Jesus coming in power is that we're all God's enemies. If the kingdom comes in conquest, we're all in the firing line. But God's plan is to save his people, to create a new humanity and to grant forgiveness. So first, Christ must die in our place. The king himself is going to be conquered. He is going to bear our punishment. Jesus is full of glory and power and he is also full of love and compassion. So the way that he leads, the way that he rules, it is not for his own selfish gain. His glory is for the benefit of his people. He could have come gloriously in power, but first he came weakly in suffering, choosing to die upon a cross so that all who submit to him as their king might be saved when he does come in power one day. This is our glorious king, a king who would die the death of a criminal by suffering and dying for his people's sin. This is a king worth following, who is worth denying yourself for, who is worth taking up your cross for, as we saw in chapter eight. This is a king who warns that all who want to save their life now will lose it but who promises that for all who lose their life now for his sake, they will save it. Jesus is a king of glory. He is a king of suffering. And the last section of our passage shows us that finally, point three, Jesus is a king to depend upon. The other nine disciples, uh, they've remained at the foot of the mountain. And it's not been easy. It seems as though they've been struggling in Jesus' absence. They they find themselves engaged in a public argument that seems to involve some teachers of the law. And then Jesus arrives, still glorious to the eye, verse 15 suggests, and he asks, verse 16, what are you arguing with them about? A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. can be easy to gloss over these details, particularly if this is a familiar story. This is a father who has had to watch on as his son suffers for who knows how long. His son can't speak. He has horrible seizures. He is hurting. And notice the father's repeated reference to a a spirit. He he senses this isn't just a straightforward medical case. No, there's, there's evil at work here. Evil that is hurting his boy. And he longs for it to end. So he'd brought his son to Jesus, but Jesus wasn't there. He'd asked Jesus' disciples to have a go at healing his son in the meantime, but, but they'd not been able to help one bit. 
Uh, So now you can sense this kind of desperation in the father's voice, the the kind of desperation that, that comes from a place of, is there any hope for my son? We've seen similar scenes in Mark's gospel before when, when people are brought to Jesus and what does he do? He, he immediately responds with compassion, heals them. But here what we read, well, well it seems to be quite a harsh response, doesn't it? Verse 19, you unbelieving generation, Jesus replied. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. It's worth noting that that Jesus doesn't address his comments to this father directly, at least, but to an unbelieving generation, maybe this father probably the crowd and the teachers of the law, and almost certainly to his disciples too. And Jesus is clearly frustrated, specifically frustrated by this generation's unbelief. But Jesus is a king of suffering who has compassion on the suffering. And so we read from verse 21, Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. He's often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for one who believes. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. I love this interaction. Jesus takes time with this father, but but he takes issue with the phrase the father uses, if you can. It's like Jesus is asking him, if I can. Are you like the rest of this unbelieving generation? Do do you not believe that I can help your son? To which the father beautifully replies in verse 24, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. That is honest. I do believe Jesus, I'm just struggling to believe, so please help me to believe. That is an amazing prayer. That is a humble prayer. A prayer that God loves to answer. A prayer that someone who is doubting this evening should definitely pray. John T. Alcott comments on these words, if is not a problem, if it drives you to Jesus. And so wonderfully, Jesus takes this man's small, tiny, mustard seed of faith and he acts in a big way, commanding this spirit to come out of the boy and never enter him again. And the spirit knows this is the king. The spirit shrieks, the boy shakes, and then the boy lies still. To which many in the crowd think, ah, Some king, Jesus has failed. He's not helped him, he's made things worse. He's dead. Well done. It's an interesting detail to include in verse 27, isn't it? An interesting interesting phrasing. He looks so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. Almost like Mark is trying to use this event to foreshadow something else. And so to demonstrate his power over sickness, his power even over death, Jesus takes the boy by the hand and lifts him up. The evil's gone. The boy is restored. And then in a flash, the scene changes. We don't get any more detail on this healing. We don't hear any reaction from the father or from his healed son because Mark wants to make a point. 
Mark instead takes us to a private room where Jesus speaks with his disciples, verse 28. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, this kind can come, can come out only by prayer. Now that is a strange ending to our passage. What, why does Mark choose to end here? Probably not where I would have ended. Why not stay with the father and his son and the rejoicing and the joy? Why come here? Is Jesus just trying to reassure his disciples that they shouldn't beat themselves up because, well, this demon, he was a proper professional, unlike some of the semi-pro demons that they'd come across before? Well, no, I don't think so. I think instead Jesus is trying to expose his disciples' total lack of dependence. At the start of this strange episode, there is no mention of the disciples having prayed at all when trying to cast out this demon. In fact, there's there's no mention of Jesus from them either. They're silent. This father had brought his son to Jesus in verse 17, but when he'd asked them, to heal his son, rather than wait for Jesus, rather than pray. The disciples had had a crack themselves in their own strength, it seems, and and what had happened, they'd, they'd failed. They'd been unable to do anything. And so I think why Mark ends here, instead of somewhere else, is that Jesus is trying to show his disciples their total need to be dependent on him that this kind can only come out by prayer, by asking God to intervene into a situation where they are powerless. Because that's what happened in these verses, isn't it? God gloriously showed up in the person of Jesus, and when he did, he did what his disciples could not do in their own strength. As he helped the suffering as he showed his glory, as he showed that he is a king to depend upon. We like to depend on ourselves. Depending on ourselves, it is exhausting. It comes with a pressure that we were not made to handle. And often when we depend on ourselves, we let ourselves down and we let others down. A writer called Melissa Broder writes, I fear others will discover that I'm not only imperfect, I'm not even okay. I fear that I truly am not okay. But most people who meet me never know that I'm struggling. On the outside, I'm smiling. I'm juggling all the balls of okayness, physical, emotional, mental, spiritual, existential. Underneath, I am suffocating. Depending on ourselves is one of the many hollow messages that our world loves to preach. And though it will work well in some situations, depending on ourselves, it will not save us from our sin. It will not save us from the power of evil. It doesn't save us from exhaustion or even burnout. And so instead, the second half of our passage has shown us a better way a more joyful way, if we will only listen. Instead of depending on ourselves, we can depend on a king who is truly glorious, a king who has suffered the punishment for sin in our place, a king who wants us to depend upon him, who invites you and I to go into this next week, whatever it holds, not relying on our own strength, not depending on our own good works or morals, not leaning on our own understanding, but who instead calls us to follow him, Jesus, our glorious servant king. Let me pray, and then the band will lead us in a song. Our Father, we so love to depend on ourselves. 
And yet, Father, thank you that you want so much better for us. You have sent us your glorious king, a king who has suffered for us, a king that we can depend upon. Thank you that he is a leader unlike any other. He is a king who will never let us down. Father, help us to fix our eyes on Jesus, the servant king, not just this evening, but throughout this week. When we are tempted to depend on ourselves, when we are tempted to think of Jesus in a way that he doesn't reveal himself to us in, would you remind us of what we've looked at this evening? Would you correct our thinking? Would you help us to listen to your son? And would we depend on him in all that we do? pray this all in his name. Amen.